afternoon. I'm Anna Karagati, the Group Editorial Director of World Screen. Thanks for being here. I'm sure you've all heard of Mad Men, the game-changing show that has raised the bar for drama series way up to the stratosphere. You may also have heard of Breaking Bad, The Walking Dead, The Killing, and Hell on Wheels. These series air on AMC in the US and on Sundance Channel Global in Europe and in Asia. AMC is a model for how original programming can change a brand, transform the perception, and catapult a channel into the public's awareness, all the while boosting ratings, attracting advertisers, and drawing critical acclaim. Josh Sapin is president and CEO of AMC Networks. He oversees not only AMC, but three other channels as well, IFC, Sundance Channel, and WeTV, in addition to IFC Films and Sundance Selects, which specialize in distributing independent films. Which, with each one of his channels, he spotted an opportunity in the market, an underserved niche, and created a destination. In the case of AMC, it was a destination for fans of classic American movies. In the case of IFC and Sundance Channel, for aficionados of independent films. And with WeTV, a destination for women. He then enriched each one of these channels with groundbreaking original shows. For the past three years, AMC Networks has been looking beyond the US and has launched Sundance Channel Global and WeTV around the world. But creating a clear strategy for original programming is just one of Josh's many accomplishments. He has also been a staunch supporter of independent filmmakers. He has created venues and video on demand strategies that allow these films to reach the broadest audiences possible. Joss is considered an innovator and pioneer, not just because he has created successful channels and brands, but because he understands viewers' needs, can anticipate their behavior, has embraced technology's offerings, and is able to work within the ever-changing vast media ecosystem. We're gonna be hearing a little bit more about his vision, but first, here is a look at Sundance Channel Global. C'est ma nouvelle assistante. Bonjour, Monsieur Draper. <rire> Je suis numéro un dans la vente aux particuliers. La cam, ça se vend tout seul, beauté. Toi, t'es que dalle. Maintenant, une seule fleur Il y a nous et il y a les morts. Ne vous faites pas mordre. This is pure glass. <laughs> We're gonna make a lot of money together. <laughs> you think I did the right thing? Everything's changed. Just like that. Busy woman, I understand. Thank you for understanding. Can only be healed by the binding together of East and West. Turn the show back on. Hola. Qué ocurre? Important places to be. Sundance was meant to be an alternative to some of the choices that are out there that are more mainstream. I don't think I'm going to watch a movie for a month. With Smack Bang in the middle of La Croisette. Action! <laughs> <laughs> I can just do the best I can in the film. Fantastic! Check it, please. 
great take. One thing. Happiness. Whatever you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna, and on behalf of AMC Networks and Sundance Channel Global, thanks to Read Me Dem for inviting me to speak at MIP. It is really a treat to be here. Uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and talk about where the pay TV business is today specifically about the paradox that the business currently finds itself in. Uh, on one hand, the enormous success of pay television worldwide and the simultaneous challenge that the internet and digital video pose to all that success, and hopefully and most importantly, what we might be able to do about it. So pay TV, whether delivered via cable, satellite, or telco, continues to be the sector to experience the greatest growth in all of television. Total revenues, including advertising, are projected to grow at a very heady pace. And for all the talk about how TV is the least favorite screen among younger audiences, teenagers today are actually watching more, <clears throat> not less TV. But here is the paradox. With all the strength of pay TV, it becomes more fragile as it becomes more successful each day. So when you walk through the Palais or the Carlton or a convention in the US, you hear a bunch of common phrases, at least I do. Cord cutting, digital disruption, binge viewing. So the binge viewing, that binge viewing had the challenge, obviously, of DVDs both the price of a box set and the necessity of being in front of a TV and not on a mobile device. When the internet is serving up the episodes, it's that much easier to binge. And it is the fact of the internet and its great facility that in one way presents the single greatest challenge to the pay TV ecosystem. The internet, I think we already know, has proven to have what might be called tsunami-like qualities. Uh, the erosion of the newspaper business and the reduction in the recorded music business to about one-fifth in total dollar volume of what it was are clear cautionary tales. Cord cutting is a fact, and while the numbers are small, they are growing. Younger people especially are increasingly watching TV on internet services like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, Google, and the Amazon-owned here in Europe Love Film. A recent research report from Nielsen confirms that more homes than ever are now broadcast and broadband only. And that means they get their TV in every way but paid cable, satellite, and telco. So on the distribution side and on the technical side, the move toward what is often referred to as TV everywhere or authentication, the ability to receive TV channels and shows that one pays for on a tablet or a mobile device or a computer is a important element for the success and the growth of the broader pay TV model. But what will keep people wanting to watch TV everywhere and paying each month to watch on all those platforms, whether it's at home, iPads, phones, or tablets is one thing and one thing only, content. Content really drives authentication and TV everywhere. And it's not just any content that drives people to those connections. We refer to it as iconic content, as the most important element in the whole authentication system. <clears throat> and I'll try and define it if I may. There's a certain type of show that is so durable, enduring, and satisfying that when somebody really likes it and they go without it, they miss it. They actually care. It's not sort of indifferent television. Unlike most TV series, these type of shows, happily many of them are on Sundance Global, are missed in a way 
that they aren't as easily substituted by the flip of a remote control or the alteration in an on-demand button. Frequently, and you can sort of ask yourself as you listen to me babble, people have sort of one, two, or three maybe of these hate-to-do-without TV shows. And I think, at least when we look at them, they stand apart from most TV and they're the sh they are the very shows that can make the pay TV system grow and endure. And I think, we think, the shows that are in that sort of iconic quadrant are the ones that have the best characters, the best writing, and the best storytelling. If you look at sort of a history of recent TV, I think we saw it on The Sopranos, to name a couple, Game of Thrones, we see it on Downton Abbey, Homeland, and we see it on our own, Mad Men, Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, and Hell on Wheels. In success, these shows are widely known, understood, referred to, <clears throat> and then occasionally parodied. So we think that when TV creates shows that are iconic and when these shows are properly deployed through technology <clears throat> that extends the viewer's ability to watch whenever and wherever they want, then TV gains the power to work with the web as opposed to against it. And that's what we're doing at Sundance Global. At the heart of this iconic content, content is a very personal connection. The personal connection is primarily established through the characters who people really identify with, they care about. These characters often have faults like their own, they're fascinating, they're complicated, they're deeply human, and they sort of become friends on the screen. A show that we have on the air in the US called Breaking Bad has just these type of characters and stories. I brought a quick clip for those of you who may not be familiar with it. I have an offer that I think would be of interest to you. You know why I do this. A man provides for his family. You're a drug dealer. I'm a manufacturer. I'm not a dealer. What did you expect me to do? Just simply roll over? That I wouldn't take extreme measures to defend myself. They're going to kill me. Jesse, do it now! Do it! The devil is in the details, okay? One little mistake, one slip-up in our story. That could ruin us. I have lived under the threat of death for a year now. I alone should suffer the consequences of those choices. No one else. And those consequences, they're coming. I will kill your wife. I will kill your son. Get me in a room with him, and I'll do the rest. Admit you're in danger. Who are you talking to right now? Who is it you think you see? I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. A guy opens his door and gets shot. You think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. Shows like Breaking Bad are not just good shows that are frequently recognized with awards which are nice. What I'm hoping to describe are shows that people really have a personal connection to. They are also the shows that pe keep people literally connected and keep paying their bills. And they are the shows that are, that are at the center of the sustainability of the pay TV system. In many ways, we believe that this sort of connection is the killer app of TV's digital age. And why, as we transition from the 20th to the 21st century, what was the big analog idea of appointment TV is giving way to the digital concept of what we might call connection TV. Connection TV, if you'll pardon it, is what happens when audiences become divorced from the constraint of linear and empowered by the digital age to get their favorite content. 
And these connected viewers can be thought of, there's a bunch of them, as super viewers, a breed of extreme fans who connect over social media and augment their impact far beyond the earlier generation of cult fans. Our TV show, The Walking Dead, has such fans, so much so that we developed a show that airs immediately after each Walking Dead episode, appropriately titled Talking Dead. And so super fans or super viewers, right after the show is over, call in <clears throat> or they tweet or otherwise connect to discuss what just went on in the show and they extend and they sort of deepen their connection to it. Uh, I have a little clip of Walking Dead followed by what the Talking Dead looks like, if you could play that one. This season on The Walking Dead. Do not enter the city. It belongs to the dead now. We're dead, all of us. Things are different now. We survived this by pulling together, not apart. We're on our own, up to us to find a way out. We're all terrified. We have fewer people. That makes us weaker. The world went to hell. Don't kill the living. Oh my god. The Walking Dead. All new episodes Sunday night at 10 on AMC. Telling the best original stories on TV. The relationship thing that I found kind of the most affecting was uh, you. I, I'm watching this episode, and b boom, she kind of hits them with the information. All right, me and, and your buddy did it, yeah. and you know the whole series long. We're like, what's going to happen when he finds out? And he has the opposite reaction of what like a man no would normally have. So I immediately race back, and I'm like, I got to see the credits. And sure enough, it was written by a woman. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way on earth. Some chick's like, I, I cheated on you with your best friend. He's just like, it's all right, it's the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so there are a growing number of examples, not just Walking Dead, of this phenomenon of the super viewer having disproportionate effect. Uh, NBC, I think, was going to cancel Community. It was off the air. There was a big upswing in attention, and now it may come back. We believe that pay TV's updated business model for now must deploy the advances in technology that allow within the system viewing everywhere on every device. We believe that while multi-screen authenticated viewing should embrace news, reality, and all formats of TV, we think it will be most significantly anchored by the programs that endure, that are iconic, and that people really connect with in a way that's terribly personal to them. And that these iconic shows can take advantage of the web when they play in a later window on a digital outlet like Netflix or others. Instead of eroding and ultimately exhausting interest in a show that may play on the web, the opposite effect can take place a sort of like after window or post window digital sort of supercharge. So this sort of virtuous circle happened, we think with us, season two of The Walking Dead in the US became the highest rated series in cable dramatic history among 18 to 49 year olds after season one was available on Netflix. And last week, the fifth season of Mad Men delivered ratings nearly 30% higher than the prior season's premiere, 40% higher than the prior season's average. The availability of the first four seasons of Mad Men, we think, on the digital outlet Netflix, allowed new fans to find the show, to catch up, and get ready for the story to continue. So it made the web work. The iconic nature of those shows and the connection that people have to them, therefore, we think, are a truly key ingredient to making the closed, paid system of television grow and grow. Uh, the pay TV industry that so many of us grew up in is being altered by impact from the internet, and it will be. 
we think that the challenge to maintaining and growing the business is to find the right technology, like TV Everywhere or authentication, married and driven by the right content that will respond to and then take advantage of the new rules of viewer engagement. And if it all works, the end result will be, and we think it will, a fully compelling business model that mar marries and takes advantage of the power of serialized and immersive storytelling to the exponential possibilities as opposed to the liabilities of a world increasingly influenced by the internet. And we would, of course, like Sundance Global to be a big part of what makes pay TV grow globally. We are investing and investing in content for the US and the globe and seeing results. When that content is put in the context of the channel and put in the hands of the capable people who are here who manage Sundance Global, people who we think can really work with platforms uh, led by, by the way, the president of Sundance Global, Bruce Tuckman, who's in the audience today, then that channel, Sundance Global, can take advantage of the technology fueled by content that people care about and want to stay with and with and with. And that combination can grow pay TV penetration point after point after point in country after country after country. I thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you here today for 20 minutes. I think that there's a little Q&A, so I'll wander over to the couch. Thanks for your kind attention. That was a great speech. A lot of food for thought in that. Um, I thought I would start. Um, we've seen all the iconic shows on AMC, besides, obviously, uh, driving your ratings. How did those original productions help you or change your perception amongst the advertising community and the cable operators who yeah. you need to you know, disseminate your channel? Sure. So <clears throat> I think that um, uh, advertisers found them quite attractive, perhaps for obvious reasons, which is the numbers were good and uh, in as much as they're interested in engagement um, and pay a premium for it, they were quite attractive. On the cable TV operator side in the US, which was sort of the intention of, to focus on in my comments, I think that what uh, cable operators and satellite companies found is that people really cared. Yeah. They really, really cared what happens next. And so the anticipation of the coming season of Mad Men or the coming season of The Walking Dead or what's happening in Breaking Bad really grew like this. And it is not to disparage or minimize other channels, they're of course important. But when there is long arc drama that people become invested in, then they really care about their connection. Right. So I think the pay TV operators or cable operators in the US saw very particular value in that content. And Right, right, right. Passionate engagement yeah, is the name yeah. of the game. Okay, now you have developed passionate <clears throat> engagement not only on AMC. Let's take Sundance Channel as an example. How have original productions enriched that offering? Sure. Well, first to just differentiate, if I may. So Sundance Channel Global uh, has the benefit of, uh, uh, depending upon the window and the deal, all the reservoir of content that comes from AMC networks, from all of our channels, specifically Sundance Channel in the US, <clears throat> is actually um, focusing now on also scripted drama. And so there are a number of scripted dramas that are coming on the channel, which actually we're very excited about. Some are co-productions, the subject of your earlier panel, and some are wholly owned by us. Um, we're doing a series called Rectify, which is executive produced by Mark Johnson, who does Breaking Bad, and we will own that wholly. And then we have a whole long list of co-productions that I won't describe to you. But in combination with, uh, I hope it's the sort of best selected and curated independent films available, um, those scripted dramas we think will add heft and importance and, if you will, connection to Sundance Channel as well. Right. Let's look beyond the United States now. Um, how do you distinguish yourself? How does AMC Networks distinguish itself in the global market? What is your competitive edge with the channels that you are offering 
pay TV platforms or cable operators around the world? Right. Well, I think, uh, just <clears throat> if I may, I think the comments I tried to make, which is that in addition to, we actually in the US, I, would, I hope this doesn't sound like a brag, we're a big distributor of independent films probably the, in terms of volume, the largest distributor. So I think we have a pretty good sense of <clears throat> film and film programming, and particularly independent film and film programming. And we have the benefit of Robert Redford, who's quite involved with the festival, and of course it is, is in a certain sense one of the great godfathers of, of indie film. So I think our film selection and curation is appropriate, and appropriate for each territory and country. And then beyond that, these dramas that we are producing are, and acquiring both, we think as television competes with alternative outlets, these, the web is going to continue to offer many, many, many options for people to get TV at their choice that linear TV, as we call it, which will be consumed on a linear basis but also on an on-demand basis, will need to be driven by something that really matters. And so we think that what Sundance Channel does globally is matter because the stories will continue mm. and the material will be new and fresh. And we hope that, if I asked you a question, do you have two or three favorite shows? I hope you have the right answer. But I would hope the right answer would be, gee, there are stories that have long arc and that I really want to stay attendant to. And that when I have time on a plane, when I'm traveling, I rack them up on my tablet. No, I've had some Portlandia moments, you believe me. You have had me. some Portlandia yes. moments. Well, <laughs> yeah. So we think that that really makes for a good channel. It really actually fundamentally helps drive the basics of the business. Right. Right, right. Um, you haven't been, or AMC Networks has not been in the global business that long. I right. think, what, three years or so? Yeah, about three years. So um, how did you decide that you wanted to branch out beyond the United States? And what opportunities do you see in the global market? Right. So uh, we decided to, um, in part, for, of course, business opportunity, but I would also describe it as imperative um, uh, in order to have productions that are ultimately ownable. One needs scale, and uh, the world's a bigger place than the United States, to say it simply. Um, we also thought that there was opportunity, because while, of course, there are many, many, many channels in different countries, we hoped that we could offer something that had a unique contribution to the success of a cable operator's business or a satellite company's business because it had this going forward anticipation of what would come with dramas that were among the best developed. So both the business imperative and we hope the opportunity. All right, and, and programming that really isn't seen that much around it, it the It actually world. significantly isn't, and so we've happily met with very good success. We're in many countries now, many platforms. It's been a pretty fast pace of growth, and we have a, a wonderful staff who's all here making it happen, thank goodness. Okay. Now thinking back to, I think it was in the 90s that you launched the four, right? Uh, most of them, uh, AMC, in, in the United States, IFC, Sundance yeah, Channel, roughly, WeTV. Yeah. If we think back to the landscape back then, it seems a little primitive <laughs> compared to the landscape we live in today, yeah. the multimedia. So <clears throat> what are the challenges and, and how do you find opportunities in right. today's landscape? Sure, so I think um, it is undoubtedly more competitive. Uh, the pay TV business has proven to be a great business, so the world's jumping in, <laughs> both on the programmer side and on the distribution side. And on the distribution side, you see names that you would not have thought likely fooling around and getting into what is 100 million US homes. Um, and of course, hundreds of millions across the globe. So right. it's really just, it's purely competition. You need to be something different, you need to be something meaningful, you need to be something that matters and is not redundant, right. and right. is not right. fungible, and you need to be something that is not available on the web, because the web does have a sort of imperative almost by its nature without anybody deciding, yeah. which is that it's available and it can have a terribly incurring effect on a paid system. We did see it in the recorded music business, we did see it in newspapers, you see it affecting other businesses. So to ignore it, I think, is at one's own peril. Mm -hmm. We think we have found a way to specifically and particularly embrace it and utilize it by actually having it drive to dramas and familiarize people with dramas and make them want the new stuff that's coming on the next season. So drive them back to the season. channel. Yeah, even it drives if they're them back to the paid watching, system. It, it drives yes. them back. Yeah, so that sort of little clip of people binging 
if it was Battlestar Galactica and they were all whooped up about Battlestar Galactica, hopefully they would say, gee, got to get more. Right, right. Let's go watch the new season. Right, right. Okay, given the, the popularity of screening shows online, um, do linear channels have a healthy future? Or do you see the day when nonlinear viewing may equal or overtake uh, nonlinear viewing, overtake linear viewing? Part one. Part two, if the online viewing or the off television set viewing continues to increase, right. what do channels have to do to remain relevant? Right, it's a really rich question. I don't know that actually anybody entirely knows the answer to it. it um, Certainly, outside of our realm, in news and sports, uh, live is live, right. and, and that, of course, is, a, is what it is. In the scripted arena, it, it's, it's interesting because we have had rating success, so we watch audiences go up in seasons four and five of Breaking Bad and Mad Men, respectively, to date, which is a anti-television pattern. Absolutely. And so, Hopefully what it suggests is that there'll be a tons of on-demand viewing, both within a paid system, meaning cable VOD or broadband VOD attached to a satellite, and there will indeed be internet on-demand viewing. But it seems that if you have enough juice behind the story you're telling, people will gather to have a sort of, I'll stop short of, use, stop short of using the word shared and say the sort of immediate experience of what happens next. Right, 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 right. And it seems to be sustaining. So on demand's a reality, but we think that at least for the foreseeable future, that phenomenon. Do you remember place. back in the days of Dallas, we had to wait how many months to find we out who shot JR? Yes. Now it's instant. Yes. <laughs> it's yes, right yes. there. Actually, though, you know, the, the um, the, ter the word spoiler alert, which right. I don't think was in the nomenclature, popular nomenclature uh, a few years ago, is suddenly now being and where does it come described from, everywhere. It was giving away the plot, you know, right, so right, it's, right, right. but it's all about that phenomenon right. and, the, and, and the technology sort of behind it. Right. I don't want to um, uh, ignore your efforts in the independent film um, arena because they're quite substantial. We have a couple of minutes left. Tell me a little bit about what you've done, how your video on demand strategies have helped take these little gems of movies that perhaps don't have a very long run in theaters and expose them to broader audiences. Sure. So, so uh, in the US, we were um, the first company, I think, to offer, w the term day and date is used for many things, but we offered movies on cable video on demand the same day that they were available in theaters, mm. which was <clears throat> anathema to the exhibition community because they thought it would erode right. their business for independent films. We had hoped and we conjectured and it proved to be true that the opposite was the case, that the films were sort of small enough, they were often sort of hidden gems, and putting them on VOD the very same day they went to theaters actually had a beneficial effect on both platforms. So we inaugurated this video on demand same day as the theater, and we priced them pretty close. We, f we fooled around with pricing, and then others joined in, other distribution companies, and they, they created pricing even higher than theatrical, sort of pre-theatrical, uh, and it has worked really quite well. So we see now more revenue from non-theatrical in aggregate than we do from theatrical. And in the United States, the so-called cable VOD distribution right. platform has become a pretty significant platform, and big studios are now messing with it. So we and other independent companies helped inaugurate it, and it's really been very, it's been a bit of a boon to indie film. Is it nice to lead the way in initiatives like that it's, and it's groundbreaking sort of, original programming? It's, it's nice when you're right. It's horrible when you're wrong. Well, so, yeah, we only talk about what we're right about. We don't mention all the wrong things. But, yeah, it feels good when... <laughs> When, you can, when, you have, when it goes your way. I would love to continue, but unfortunately our time is up. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, thank you, very you much Reed Meadham, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank Josh. Thank you very much. <clears throat>